titan the greatest scam in the history of the church age my name is olushe gumokuolu how could any man say that titan in the church age is a scam we're going to be looking at this in this video some people preach tight out of ignorance some preach titan out of greed but what exactly is the position of the bible on titan several believers have never taken their time to cross check what exactly the word of god says about titan they have only been told with one or two verses of the scriptures that they are supposed to pay titan and this bring millions if not billions and there are those who are genuinely concerned that if we don't pay tight how are we going to finance the church how are we going to provide for the ministers of god now before i go ahead let me say that this video it's not to castigate anybody. It's not to bring any church down. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm spirit filled. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ myself. And I'm a teacher of the word of God. I'm not interested in any part of the body of Christ being disgraced, being shamed. But truth must be told. This lie has been on enough. It only takes the reading of the word of God and you will be absolutely clear. There are people that have been so brainwashed that they will even avoid anyone who wants to bring the scripture to their understanding. They don't want to hear anything. They believe in what they know and they leave it at that. I believe that as believers, if somebody has a view different from mine, I will welcome that view. I want that person to show me from the scripture what that person teaches or understands. And that person should also listen to what I'm about to also show or say. That way, we can both make informed decision. I want to plead with you, if you are watching this video, please ensure you watch it till the end. I'm going to go slow. I'm going to be very systematic. I'm going to be looking at scripture. This is not a message of manipulation. I just want people to look at scripture. It doesn't hurt to read the Bible, right? It doesn't hurt. So just pick your Bible and then you follow till the end. What exactly does Bible teaches about Titan? Some have said that Titan is not about the law. You know, that's what most preachers of tight teaches. The reason is because they know that if you say tithing is of the law, then they have no basis to take tight. Because they, we know that we are no more under the law. And so they prefer to say that, no, tithing is not of the law. It started with Abraham. And I'm going to show you that passage. I know many believers have never taken their time to open to that passage and read. We are going to read it together and you are going to see what transpired there. And then we are going to move systematically. Some are saying, but Jesus said we should pay tight. What about Malachi 10? Are you going to explain it away? All of this will be answered in this video by the grace of God. I'm trusting God that God's children will come to this understanding. Why am I doing this video? It is because the scripture makes it absolutely clear that when you actually tithe, you have actually made Christ of non-effect. And we shall soon discover that. Otherwise, I would not have bothered. But the implication of such a wrong doctrine is so great upon the soul of the believers. Now, the first thing I would like to share with you is this. There are two covenants. The covenant of Moses 
or what they call the Mosaic Covenant and the Covenant of Christ. The Covenant of Moses is not Old Testament. It's not the division of the Bible called Old Testament. You can call it Old Testament, you can call it Old Covenant, but it is not the division of the Bible. It is not Genesis to Malachi. The New Covenant also is not Matthew to Revelation. You know, this is very important for what we are going to discuss. Because when we tell people that we are not under the law, they are like, are you saying that Genesis to Malachi is no longer relevant? No. It's relevant. Every scripture is about Jesus. Jesus himself said, these are the scriptures that testifies of me. So every scripture tells us something about Jesus Christ. So there is no way we are going to make any scripture irrelevant. Even the law came to show us Jesus, came to show us that the only way of salvation will be through Jesus Christ because the law couldn't deliver from sin. Some don't understand this and lack of understanding of this creates a fundamental error in the body of Christ. I'll give you an example, the Ten Commandments. If I ask you, should we keep the Ten Commandments? I've asked in several places. And the answer I get is that, oh, of course we should keep the Ten Commandments, which is absolutely wrong. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. Now, what are those commandments? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Are you saying we, we can lie? Are we saying we can commit adultery? No. You have to understand what the law is. Adam didn't need any law. He only had a command not to eat this fruit. He carried the life of God inside of him. When he sinned and he was driven out of the garden, it took some years before God introduced the law. Why was the law introduced? He said that law may, that sin may increase, that we might know what sin is. So the law doesn't set free from sin. It shows you what sin is. Now, because man is a sinner by nature, so the law says that shall not commit adultery, but man is a sinner by nature. So a man sees a woman, he wishes to have sex with that woman, but he remembers that if he, if he tries it and is caught, he will be stoned to death according to the law. So he restrained himself. So the law restrains, but the law doesn't set free from sin. So trying to keep the Ten Commandments doesn't bring eternal life. You remember the, the young rich ruler that came to Jesus. Say, how, what must he do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, he said, you know the law, go and keep it. He said, which one? He said, thou shalt not commit adultery or lying. He was keeping all of that from his youth, but he didn't have eternal life. But Jesus said, if you look at a woman lost after her in your heart, you have already committed adultery. So how can you be now delivered from that? That's where the cross of Jesus Christ comes in. So in Romans chapter 6, we are told that we have been crucified with Christ. He took our sinful nature and nailed it to the cross. So I don't need that law that says thou shalt not commit adultery. Because now I have the life of God that doesn't commit adultery. If a man drinks alcohol, and, but he is now dead, you now put alcohol by his side. Can he drink? No. So that man doesn't need a law that says thou shalt not drink alcohol. He can't drink alcohol because he's dead. So because we are dead to sin, we don't need law about sin. We now live by the law of the spirit of life of Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 8. So you must understand that when we talk about covenant, we are talking about the covenant that God established with the children of Israel through Moses. And it has a lot of things that it encompasses. When we say New Testament or New Covenant, we are talking about the covenant of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. We are not talking about Matthew to Revelation. Please understand this basics now if we now i've written a book on on titan title back to titan i'll put a link in the description of this video i'm just going to be sharing from some of the things uh that are in this book and i have the scripture with me we'll be reading the scriptures now where did we have anything that looks like tight in the bible that is in genesis chapter 14 Melchizedek and Abraham. Please follow me. 
you have you can read it in your bible you can follow me also and see if i'm manipulating the scripture or if i'm saying something that is not correct you also can read it yourself and see it so just follow me genesis chapter 14 verses 18 to 24 and Melchizedek, the king of salem brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and the earth. And be blessed, and blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thy enemies into thy hand. Now, let me stop here first. Abraham had gone to fight five kings. With about 300 or 360 servants. And God gave him great victory. So they brought spoil. They asked Abraham to take from it. But he was just coming from this war when Melchizedek appeared to him. Now, note this Abraham had not given Melchizedek anything. Melchizedek of himself blessed Abraham. The scripture says this, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And that is speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's a discussion for another day. He brought bread and wine for Abraham. Now, who is giving someone something first here? Melchizedek. It was not Abraham. Abraham, not, Abraham had not given him anything. And then he now blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God. Now notice, he had given him food. He has blessed him. Abraham had not yet given him anything. You know, because they will just read this scripture and tell you that Abraham paid tight to Melchizedek. Now, but you can see the sequence. It was Melchizedek who came forth and met Abraham, gave him wine and bread, and then blessed him, and then he blessed God. And then we now read next. And he gave him tithes, plural, plural, tithes of all, which means that it wasn't really 10% of one thing. It's of many things, tithes, plural. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and the earth, that I will not take from I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe lashed, that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou say, I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the young men which went with me. Anna, Eshko, Mamre, let them take their portion. Now look at the scenario. Abraham gave tent of the spoils, not of his own goods. Tent of his spoils, tithes of his spoils, to Melchizedek. And then what happens to the remaining 90%? He said he is not going to touch it neither. That those who went to war with him, they can get their own portion. But as far as he is concerned, he is not going to touch anything. So in other words, Abraham didn't give 10% and keep 90 to himself. Abraham didn't pay this tithe from his farm produce, from his monthly salary. From his yearly salary. Abraham never repeated this after this incident. So in what way does this serve as a basis that you should be paying a tenth of your salary every month or a tenth of any income you have? This is just the beginning. Now, this is, we have not said anything complicated so far. This is scripture that you yourself can look at, see the sequence, and read. 
Abraham wasn't paying tight from his farm produce. It was from the spoil of war. And ex uh, something he did only once. Just once. Now, you will remember that Christ is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> that is found in Hebrews chapter 7, which we shall, soon, we shall still read later. Verse 17. For he testified, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And you and I in Christ, we are priests in the order of Christ. We will soon get to all of that later. But what we have established thus far is that it wasn't a kind of practice as we see today. It wasn't from his income. It was Melchizedek who blessed Abraham, who brought bread and wine to him. Abraham only gave him a tenth of the spoils of war. All right? Now, if you turn, uh, if you turn with me, one of the things you will notice is that Melchizedek was also a priest. The Bible says, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Because you will later see that it is only priest that takes tithes on behalf of God. So even Melchizedek, was a priest and Christ is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, that is where it ended with Abraham. Except when we now read in Hebrews that he gave tithes of the nations within him. He had given their tithes. The next time we are going to read about Titan had to do or something like Titan has to do with Jacob. In Genesis 28 verses 12 to 22, Jacob slept because it's a fairly long passage. I'm just giving the scriptures and read some aspect of it. Uh, Jacob slept, had a dream, and here is what God said to him. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. In thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with thee, I will keep thee in all places where thou goest. And will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now, God didn't put any condition to these promises. Jacob didn't solicit for this. It was an encounter initiated by God himself. As far as God was concerned, God had concluded the matter. God didn't say, if you give me this, that's when I'm going to do this to you. No, God, had, God was expressly clear. Look at what happened when Jacob woke up. And Jacob awaked out of sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew him not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. He was the one making all these assumptions and conclusions. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it up 
for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first and Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me. Now look at this. What is this? Unbelief. This is not an example for us to follow. When God told Mary what will happen, he said, let it be to me according to your word. That's all. But Jacob here is giving God condition. He said, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go, I will and will give me bread to eat. Look at the things he's talking about. God was talking about Jacob being a blessing to the entire human generation. He said, the, he said, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God was talking about Jesus Christ. Jacob was talking about food. If you give me food to eat and remain to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Can you imagine? <laughs> and this stone, which I have set for the pillar, shall be God's house, and all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. First, he didn't build a house for God here. <laughs> he said, he shall be God's house. Jacob didn't build any house for God, right? He promised to give a tent. Again, God didn't ask for that. God didn't solicit for it. God did not make his promises to David conditional. It was David, oh, sorry, to Jacob. God didn't make that promise conditional. He is the one who put all those vows there for God. Now, when at what point did he redeem the vow? Jacob clearly did not um, redeem that 10% commitment to God. He did not. When he returned from that land, he met Esau. He gave 50% of everything he acquired to Esau. So number one, it's not even, it wasn't possible any longer for him to redeem 10% because he had given 50% to Esau. And there was no record, no account that Jacob paid that 10%. But God fulfilled all his promises to Jacob. Everything the Lord said he was going to do through him, God actually did through him. God fulfilled the promise. So again, you see that it wasn't uh, something required by God. It was not something Jacob fulfilled. And um, there is no instance in the scripture that suggests to us that it became a practice for him, that Isaiah giving God 10%, 10%. There was nothing like that. So the next time we are now going to read about Titan, it had become a law. It had become a law. Now, if you uh, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, it says, let me read it here. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5. It says, And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, you remember that we said earlier that uh, it's only the priest that takes the tithe, and even Melchizedek was a priest. So the Levi, they received the priesthood. So it says, let me read it again. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. So, Titan finally became a law. Before Titan became a law, there was no one paying tithe 
In fact, it was only Abraham who paid tight from the spoils of war. It's very important to stress that he paid tight from the spoils of war. So finally, God made it a law to the children of Israel and it became a tight according to law. Now, so this is what we have said thus far. So now the nation of Israel will start operating tight. But what exactly are the laws of tithing? If you read Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 to 32, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 to 32, it says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithe, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. You can actually redeem your tithe. <laughs> and concerning the tithe of the head or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. Now, you will see that there are different categories of tithes. Uh, tithes of the seed of the land, of the fruit of the tree, of the heave offering. You, if you read Numbers, um, 18, Numbers chapter 18, verse 25, you will see that there are various tithes. In fact, in Deuteronomy 12, 17, we also have Tithe of the corn, tithe of the wine, of the oil, of the fossilings, of the earth, and of the flocks. So you see, for them, tithe is not something as simple as 10% of your income. According, uh, according to the law. Now, tithe can only be administered in the temple. That's where you can administer the, the tithe, in the temple. So if you read Deuteronomy 12, 5 to 6, uh, and Numbers 18, 26, which I will read first, it says, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithe, plural, which I have given you from them for inheritance, then ye shall offer up an eve offering of it <laughs> for the Lord. Even a tenth part of the tithe. You see, the, the law of, the, of tithing is not simply a law that says bring 10% of your income. He deals with many aspects. When they receive tithe, even a tenth of the tithe is also received as is presented rather as heave offering unto the Lord. And this is according um, according to the law by God. And then in Deuteronomy 12 5 to 6 it says but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribe to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shall thou come, and thither ye shall bring your bond offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes. The tithe is not is not something that is taken anywhere. The tithe is not something that is taken into the account of the high priest. No, it has to come to the temple. It says the tithe and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your free will offering and the firstlings of your heads and of your flocks. Now, where is the temple today? This is why it is impossible to tithe. It's not even a question of is tithing right or is tithing wrong. It is, is tithing possible? Brethren, it is not possible. You may say you have been tithing. You have not been tithing. What you have been doing is not tight. 
tithe is well defined. The execution is well defined. The place to bring it is well defined. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it now says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16. If you read 1 Corinthians 6.19, it says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. They had under the, uh, the Mosaic Covenant, under the Old Covenant, they had first the tabernacle and then later on the temple. All of that is no longer available today. We are the temple of God. It is not the intention of God to dwell in house built by the hands of man. God can only dwell in us because he created us. So God can dwell in us. So we are now the temple. There's no more temple. The assemblies that we go to is not a replica of the temple. <laughs> it's a place of gathering. It is even wrong to say, I'm going to church. You are not going to church. You are going to a church building. A place where members of the body of Christ assemble together in his name. So the church is not the temple, or the, the church building rather, is not the temple or a replica of the temple. It is our body that is a replica of the temple. So now you understand that there is no temple anymore, but the law of Titan says it has to be brought to the temple. And as we have established that tithe is not just 10% of your income. There are laws that guide it, including even 10% of that tithe. You will soon see that even uh, you can eat of your tithe. And we had read earlier that you can also redeem your tithe. All of this according to the law. But someone may be asking, Maybe it was because they were agrarian society. Now we earn money, even though we are also still agrarian, because every food we eat still has to be planted. But I understand. Back then they had soldiers who earn wages. People have wages. That's why Jesus talked about uh, a laborer is worthy of his wages. Soldiers are paid in wages. The high pri the priests, the Pharisees, they pay wages to servants that work with them. But in case we are still thinking and say, well, maybe it's because they were agrarian society. Now we are earning money. God addressed that also. So turn again with me to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23 to 26. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23 to 26. You can see that thus far, we are going slowly. We are looking at scriptures. We are laying foundations. That's how to teach. You don't just go and pull one verse out. You see, that's why if you ask me, is tight right? I don't answer. Because if I say it is right, somebody who doesn't believe in it will question me further. If I say it is not right, somebody who believes in it will question me further. Yet, when you tell them and say, let's study the Bible together, they are like, no, 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 no. Just tell me whether it's right or no. They, you have to be taught the word of God. It's, you know, the Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm going to address some other issues. Like some people will say, but there are people who have testimonies. There are big men of God, big churches who have been doing these things for years. The scripture says, do not follow the multitude to do wrong. That means multitude of people can go wrong. In fact, in most cases, people go wrong in multitude. Sodom and Gomorrah, it was in multitude. The ancient word, word of Noah, they, it was in multitude that they went wrong. People usually go wrong in multitude. So, but let's read Deuteronomy 14, 23 to 26. 
it says, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. Now, what are you supposed to eat? The tithe of thy corn. Are you reading your Bible? This is written black and white in the Bible. I thought they say, oh, the tithe is the Lord. You cannot touch it. <laughs> this is God speaking. It says, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God. What are you eating? In the place which it shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thy oil, and fatlings of thy herbs, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. The whole essence of all these laws was that God was teaching them the fear of God. If you fear God, if you live in accordance to his word, he will bless your land, he will bless your fruit, you will see the reward. It pays to fear the Lord. That's the whole goal. But my point is this. They are to eat of their own tithe. According to the... This is scripture I'm reading to you. You can pick a Bible and read it yourself. Now, but... <clears throat> we have a scenario where the temple is located in Jerusalem. But there are 12 tribes and they are located far from each other. Some are far away from the temple. So here, here's what the Lord said. He now says that, And if the way be too long for thee, if the way be too long, so that thou art not able to carry it, because you are supposed to bring your tithe to the temple, but you live in a very far country, or in a very far place, you have expanded, or maybe you were taken as a slave, now you want to come and bring your tithe. It says, If the place be too long, be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord shall thy God had blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. You shall turn it into money. You shall turn your tithe into money. What shall you do with that money? It says, And bind up the money in thy hand, and thou shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall, shall choose, and thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusted after, for oxen, for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatever thy soul tasted. And thou shalt eat dear before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy household. It means you are not going to give money to the high priest. You will still go and buy your tithes. Those things that you could have just brought and eaten out of it, you will still go and then buy it. So it answers the question. You know, because they lie a lot. They tell you that it was because it was an agrarian society. No, the Bible, there was money being spent then. Money was already being spent. You remember Abraham paid money to acquire Hebron, the land where he, he buried the wife Sarah. So you see that money has been in existence a long time ago. It's not when we start using MasterCard. Now, so he is to buy that tithe. So tithe is not money. God is not looking for your money. God has not asked anybody to pay tithe that is money. Anybody that preaches that is heresy. It does not matter the level. You cannot be higher or greater than the word of God. It doesn't matter. You may have preached it for 50 years. It is nonetheless the lie. Can't you see all the religions in the world? Some are as old as 600 years. Does it make them to be true? But look at the billions of people. Do you know the billions of people that follow Hinduism, that follow Buddha, that follows Islam? Billions. 
Does he make it the truth? No. That you have done something for a long time, or that a lot of people are doing it, doesn't make it the truth. And no human being, no preacher, is bigger than the word of God. I just read to you scriptures. How else do you want to explain this scripture? It's written black and white. It's not money. So we have established that. Now, guess what happened? You remember in Mark chapter 11. Let me read what happened in Mark chapter 11. Verse 15 to 17. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and said, and sit of them that sold those, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he thought, saying unto them, It is written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Do you know what gave rise to this? Now look at it. They were to convert their money and bring it to, the, to Jerusalem and buy their tithe and eat out of it. But I think some smart people just thought, okay, let's just bring these goods they are going to buy to the temple. And because they may be coming with foreign currency, maybe some money changers were there. And that was how they started exchanging, selling things in the temple. So it became so worse they were selling it. Because people, you brought it to the, you are going to bring it to the temple. So it will be convenient for you to come and buy it in, at, at the temple. Rather than get to Jerusalem and then buy it somewhere in Jerusalem, but still far away from the temple and still have to carry load to the temple. That was the genesis of the exchange that Jesus later had to go and correct them. So, tight is not money. Now, what about Malachi chapter 3 verse 10? <laughs> the one that everybody quotes so much. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Now, in Malachi chapter 1, the Lord was dealing with the offering of animals that are not proper. Now, let me explain this before I go into that. All the prophets, they wrote um, at a time, mostly when the children of Israel, or when the nation of Israel was still functioning and working, when they had their covenant. So Isaiah, for example, he wrote under three or four kings. And he corrected their disobedience. Now, their disobedience would definitely be in relation to their laws. Jeremiah came, it was the same. Ezekiel, Osea, Amos, all of them. Now, there is no minor prophet. I heard people say there are minor prophet, major prophet. There is no minor prophet or major prophet with God. All are all prophet of God. Just because one wrote one chapter of, of prophecy and one wrote 66, doesn't make the one who wrote 66 major. Neither does it make the one who wrote one minor. It's a wrong coinage. I don't know where theologians got that from, but there's nothing like that in the scripture. Anyway, so when you when you read your Bible, for example, you will see that all the prophets were correcting the wrongs of the children of Israel. So when they were not offering uh, their bond offering, a prophet will come and correct them. So you can't go and read that and say, this prophet said they were not offering their burnt offering. And so today, you must be offering a burnt offering. That, you are reading the Bible wrongly. So Malachi chapter 1 talked about they sacrificing lame animals, blind animals. God said, can you give this to your masters? Can you give this to your governors? Will they accept it of you? So God corrected them. Now, my question is this. If you want to take Malachi chapter 3, why, why will you leave Malachi chapter 1? <laughs> what is wrong with Malachi chapter 1? Why are you not telling people to sacrifice right animals today? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's our burnt offering. He's our sin offering. He's our heave offering. He's our everything. The whole Bible 
the whole plan of God, it's about Jesus Christ. He's our salvation. Now, in chapter 2 of Malachi, the Lord dealt with the issue of my treating of wives and bringing offering, sacrifice. It again, you see, it's connected with sacrifice. He says that you weep, you cry, that I don't accept your offering. And you say, what have you done? And God said, don't you know that you might treat your wife? So God was dealing with the issue. And you can see the priority. Okay, he is not even talking about tight here. He was talking about men might treating their wives. And then bringing all manner of sacrifice. He's not going to accept it. Say, I am a witness. Every time you are my treating your wife, though people don't know what you are doing, he said, me, I, God, I see it. I'm seeing everything that you are doing to that woman, the wife of your youth. When you leave her and you go and sleep with other, other women, I'm seeing it. When you shout on her, when you disgrace her, when you beat her, I'm seeing it. You are dealing treacherously with that woman and I will judge you. And I've started already by ensuring that your prayer is not answered. What did Peter also say? Say you should treat them as weaker vessels so that your prayer be not hindered. Their prayer was being hindered. So this prophet was addressing that at that time. Can we learn from it? Certainly, yes. Does that now mean that I will now say, okay, let me treat my wife right? So that when I now carry a goat and take it somewhere, it will be acceptable. No, we are not offering goat anymore. Now, having said that, so in Malachi chapter 3, in Malachi chapter 3, the prophet was addressing the fact that they were not paying tithe according to the law, all that we have been saying earlier. The law that we had looked at, they were no more doing it. So rather than take their tithe, bring it to the temple, everybody just sit at home and continue to live their lives. And God said, you have robbed me. Now, understand that we are not even under this covenant. But when the covenant was operational, it was not dealing with 10% of your money. So there is nothing that suggests that you should pay tight or that you can even pay tight. It is impossible to tight. It's very simple. So the Malachi passage doesn't raise anything. If you want to use that Malachi passage, then we can open to Ezekiel, open to Jeremiah, open to all of them and see that where God also said that you have not offered this sacrifice, you have not offered that. And let us be offering all of those sacrifices. It was a prophet addressing an issue. But you know something? We deceive people who do not understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, for like I said, if you don't know what the covenant means, somebody will pick the Bible, for example, and see that Elijah called fire to destroy people. And so he goes also and pray, Lord, all my enemy, let fire destroy them. Let fire, or a pastor can come and preach that Abraham, that Elijah said, if I be the man of God, if I be the man of God. Now, if he shows you that, he asks you, he said, open your Bible, read it. You also, you are reading it, that he said that, and fire came down. But what you didn't know, that's where rightly dividing the word of truth comes in, that Jesus said, when the, his own disciple wanted to call fire, that he did not come to destroy men. What did Elijah do? He did destroy men. That's Jesus. Jesus is the only one that God has said, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. Hear ye him. Full stop. Every other person in the scripture, to the extent to which they show us Jesus, is to that extent we emulate them. Their story is not in the Bible to tell us that they are our example or they are persons we should follow. The devil is in the Bible. Judas is in the Bible. All manners of people are in the Bible. The only person God has raised for us is Christ. We are not to follow Elijah, 
Some people are praying today for the days of Elijah. I say, why will you pray for the days of Elijah when we already have Christ? Is the day of Christ not better than the days of Elijah? Or you are praying for the spirit of Elijah. What spirit does Elijah have other than the Holy Spirit? Today, that Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. So that's where the problem comes. So somebody will open the Bible and say, he says, you have robbed me of my tithe. If you don't pay your tithe, you'll be tight. I even have someone says, if you don't pay tithe, you won't make heaven. <laughs> that person has nullified what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. We are saved by grace. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. It's not by paying anything. None of us can pay for our salvation. None of us can pay for the least of the mercy of God. None of us. So when they pick this Bible and they open it to you, because you don't know how to divide the word of truth, because you cannot bring other scriptures together, then they begin to manipulate you with fear. I tell you, if you don't do this, you will do this. If you don't do this, since the commencement of my work with the Lord, and I'm so grateful to God that God brought this understanding to me, that I can't even tithe. So I've never been tithing. I'm alive today. God has been faithful to me. Time will not permit me to share with you the testimony of the faithfulness of God. But I'm still coming. Because somebody may say, are you against giving? We are not in any way against giving. In fact, I'm going to show you how believers are supposed to give. We're going to understand that. But it's very important that we go systematically. I think there's one more hurdle we need to cross. And that had to do with Jesus himself. And I'm going to read it. Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay tithe of mint and of anise and of cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. This ought ye to have done, and not leave the other undone. Clear. By Jesus. Now, the first thing we want to say is this. As far as Jesus is even concerned, tight was not a weightier matter. <laughs> you know, the church has made tight today the, the heaviest matter. In fact, the only reason why Jesus is placed about, above tight is simply out of hypocrisy. So many of the preachers of tithe, they actually believe tithe will solve all your problems. But Jesus, even according to the law, is saying tithe is not a weightier matter. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Jesus came to walk and fulfill the law. He operated under the law. He had not yet died and resurrected. So he cannot do away with the existing law. So notice that even the temple that Jesus knew will be destroyed in three days time. He still kept them away from defiling that temple. Because as long as that covenant is, subsist is existing, is operative, is in operation. It has to be obeyed because it is the law of God. So Jesus Christ himself operated under the old covenant. When he was going to heal the ten leprous men, did you, did you remember? He said something. He said, go and show yourself to the priest. Jesus was not doing drama. He wasn't going to heal them through drama. It was because in Leviticus, the scripture actually says, when you have a sign of leprosy, you must go and show yourself to the priest. So rather than go and show themselves to the priest, these people are wondering about. So Jesus focused their hearts on the law of God. That see, go and obey the scripture. Go and do what the scripture actually says. Now, you notice that even for Jesus... When he was born, in Luke chapter 2, verse 24, Luke chapter 2, verse 24, 
He says, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said of the law of God, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. That was what was offered when Jesus was born. Why did they offer this? Why was this offered? Because Jesus operated under the law. When Jesus was born, he was taken to the temple. None of us is taken to the temple again. No more temple. So, for as long as that law was inexistent, Jesus would expect that they, they work according to that law. So, he expected the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the people of Israel at that time to practice the law that the Lord had given to them. So, when he was saying uh, that and the tithe should not be left undone. Yes, it should not have been left undone. They were still under the law. They ought to pay tithe. They ought to pay, they ought to offer bond offering, sin offering, heave offering, all of the offerings. They ought to maintain the Passover. Do we maintain any Passover today again? No. But even Jesus kept all of those, was it not at the last one that Jesus instituted the Holy Communion? So it's very clear. Jesus is not telling everybody, anybody to be paying tight today. Jesus said this to those who lived under the law. And I've cited several instances that Christ himself followed the law because he was the one that actually came to fulfill the law. He himself is the fulfillment of the law. Now, there was a church in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, the church in Smyrna. Jesus writing to them said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. It's very germane that I mentioned this. Jesus was writing to his church and he was saying that I know that you are poor. I know that you are poor, but immediately he added, but thou art rich. Now, if they were poor, I thought Jesus would say, oh, you were poor because of tithes. You are poor because you don't pay tithes. You are poor because you don't sow seed. That's what many ministers of God will say today. But he said, thou art rich. Jesus forever changed the definition of poverty. You see, earthly, when we are talking of poverty, Jesus understands what we mean. Lack of money, basically. Lack of resources. But Jesus is saying, as long as your life is right with me, you are not poor. Even though materially speaking, you may be broke. So tithing is not a kingdom way to make money, the way they will make you believe. It's not a kingdom way out of poverty. It is a lie. The church, the other church, I think the Laodicean church, that said, I am rich, I have need of nothing. Jesus said, you are poor and you are wretched. So poverty, God doesn't see poverty the way we see poverty. When Joseph was, was in the house of Pharaoh, you notice that the Bible kept saying that he prospered. Why? Because the Lord was with him, yet he was a slave boy. He didn't have a penny to his account. They could kill him at any time they wish. Yet he prospered. So Jesus did it. This is Jesus. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 to 10. Writing to his own church. And he didn't say, oh, let me show you the formula to be rich. He didn't do any of that. Now, look at Look at this in, in Galatians, which I will still round up with this, but in Galatians chapter 5, verse 3 to 4, it says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Circumcision is in the law. Some people still want to continue to circumcise. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. In the same way, tithes 
is of the law. So if you want to be tightened, you are falling from the grace. This is why I'm sharing this message. This is the burden in my heart for this message. You see, it will, it will pay me personally to support tithing. I've seen people who felt, oh, I've blessed their life. Can they be paying their tithe to me? I said, number one, there's nothing like tithing. You cannot, it's impossible to tithe. It's not just that I can't receive it, but it is even impossible to do it. You can give freely, and I'm going to get to all of that. In fact, there is nothing wrong that you decide to set aside certain percentage of your income for your assembly, for the ministry, for the work of God as God lays it on your heart. There's nothing wrong with that. We have been bought with a price. We are no more our own. It's not a matter of you owning 90% and giving God his 10%. Today, 100% belongs to God. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that ye offer your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Now, if you offer your body to God, who then owns anything that, that belongs to that body? Aha! Is God. Everything that belongs to that body belongs to God. And if you read, uh, if I read to you, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, he says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Our life is no more our own. Do you know that I, I, I work, I earn salary, at least as at the time of this video. That salary belongs to God, 100%. But when I say it belongs to God, 100%, when we say something belongs to God, we don't mean that I should go and take it and give to the church. That's when I'm giving to God. No. He that gives to the poor lends to the Lord. He that takes care of his family is right. Giving to the things of God is right. Giving to ministers of God is okay. Helping people, help, taking care of your family, meeting needs of people around you. Meeting your own needs. When Jesus was teaching Peter the principle, of kingdom finance. He said, take a hook, go lunch. You will find a fish. You will see money in his mouth. Bring it out and pay for me and for you, for Christ and for Peter, for the kingdom of God and for your personal needs. So there's nothing wrong spending money like this. There's nothing wrong. It's just that you are not tightening. You can decide and say 10% of my salary will be going to my assembly. You can say 25% of my salary will go to this ministry. You can say 5% of what I earn is what I'll be giving in my church or what I will give to this kingdom project or what I will give to this motherless baby home or what I will be giving to these poor people. Whatever. You are free to determine all of that. But because you must understand that you are no more your own. You have been bought with a price. It's not a matter of 100%, uh, 10% to God. No, as at that time, God had not yet taken over man fully. Now, God has us fully. Ye are no more your own. This is scripture. This is scripture. You are not your own. Somebody owns you. You can't own anything and it will be your own when you yourself, you are owned by somebody. Somebody has paid the price for you. So even this clothes that you are seeing on me, does not belong to me. It belongs to God because he owns me. Do you know that if he wants to take this cloth and give it to somebody else, he can do it. If I resist, I can be dead and somebody else will take over this cloth. Everything now belongs to God. You must understand that you are to live your life. It is your life God is looking for. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that ye offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You are telling lies. You are fornicating. You are cheating. You are stealing. And you are saying, I'm paying my tithe. I'm paying my tithe. You are divorcing your wife. And you are saying, I'm paying my tithe. You are maltreating your children. You are saying, I'm paying my tithe. It's a lie. It's fraud. God is not interested in that. That's not what God is looking for. 
Yield your life completely to God. That's what God is looking for. When you yield your life, God will have easy access and control to your resources. Everything will belong to him. So now we are done with Christ. Let's now cross over to the book of Acts. Where the church started in Acts chapter 2. Now, the only time we have anything mentioned about tithe uh, in the later scriptures is in the book of Hebrews. And it has nothing to do with paying of tithe. He was even explaining how, um, what is it called? How we have been translated into the new covenant of Christ. How the law that brought about tithing and so on are no longer operational. How we have changed from the priesthood of Aaron to the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is the priesthood of Christ. And you know, there was a day I was watching a very popular man of God in my country, who probably is one of the most pro, uh, proponent uh, or promoter of the issue of tithe. And he was going to read the book of Hebrews. It's good I mentioned this. He was going to read, he was reading the book of Hebrews. They were putting it on the screen for him. And he was reading and he was making comments. Now, I was there with some other people who were watching. And I told the people around, I said, this man preaches tight. If he is preaching it, if he is correct, he will read verse 5. And he will find out that that verse 5 has nullified what he's preaching. But I bet you this man will not read verse 5. So the people who were scrolling on the screen, they put verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 7. He read it. They put verse 2. He read it. He made a comment. Verse 3. Verse 4. And then they put verse 5. Get what he said. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want this. Move to the next one. <laughs> I was so sure that he was not going to read that verse 5. What is in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 7? Let me read it. And indeed those who receive, and indeed those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithe from the people according to the law. So if you are no more operating according to the law, you can't take tithes. That's why I knew that he cannot read that verse. He will jump it. So many of them, when they get to this part, they will just confuse people, just read Maro and so on. The bottom line is the love of money. That's the bottom line. It's just the love of money. You know? So, but we now notice that the apostles, they were not preaching tithes. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to verse 37 they were not preaching tight. When revival broke out, or when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and they believed, they clung steadfastly to the doctrines of the apostles, to fellowship, to prayer, to breaking of bread. And there was none that lack among them. Let me read it. It says, And the multitude of them that believed with one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that out of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Can you imagine? We are talking of more than 5,000 people. And none of them was saying, oh, what I have belongs to me. Why? Why? It's because they've been taught that they have been bought with a price. They were no more their own. I pray God we open our eyes in the body of Christ. We have become too selfish and too self-centered. Titan has robbed us of the compassion and love that we should mostly have for one another. This is what we should pursue. Now, the Bible says that, and with great power, the apostle witness of the resurrection of Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any of them that lacked. Today, the pastors are becoming millionaires, billionaires. They are boasting about it. Members are suffering. Many cannot feed themselves. It is sheer wickedness. Sheer wickedness. I don't understand how they go to bed that way. It's not your money. Look at what they said. The Bible says, For as many as were possessors of lands, of houses, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, 
and lay them down at the apostles' feet. They were giving it to the apostles. They were putting it at their feet. And distribution was made for every man according as he had need. So, look at it. They brought things. The apostles didn't hold it. How do you think many are becoming rich and millionaires today? Because the things that comes to the church, they believe is their own. They are in charge of it. And then they are becoming rich. And the people are becoming poorer. The apostles didn't do that. They distributed everything. They practiced warning. They, they had a clear understanding that we are one body. This is my brother. This is my sister in Christ. They didn't harbor anything. They didn't take those things to their account and turn it to their own. Clearly, they were not preaching tight. If they were preaching tight, it would have been easier for Ananias and Sapphira to bring 10%. Because the Bible said that they brought half. They brought half to the apostles. So if they brought half, it would have been easier. If they brought 50% to bring 10%, they were not preaching tight. They were preaching love. They were preaching love. So people gave all that they have. That's what we are supposed to do. So you will see that we are not against giving. We are actually teaching. We are teaching right giving. Giving with the mind of Christ. Giving the way Jesus wants us to give. That is what we are teaching. They never preach tight. Paul never preached tight. Peter never preached tight. John never preached tight. Where did we see this? You will notice that immediately, everything that has to do with tight, uh, the law has stopped. Everything. In fact, Peter, who was still afraid to mix with the Gentiles, God had to send a vision to him, and he went to the house of Cornelius. Under the law, he could not have done that. But that law was no longer in existence. Or operation, rather. Because that law is now fulfilled in Christ Jesus. We are now in the covenant of Christ. The law is a shadow. The reality is Jesus Christ himself. So when you see the early church and today's church with regards to Titan, we are miles apart. For us today, it's almost like if you don't pay tight, you are a nobody. You know, you are a no there are many sad things about Titan. You know, and then somebody will say that, well, he paid tight and then he had this breakthrough and so on. Let me tell you something. God is just merciful to us. God blesses us, is faithful to us, not because we give anything. It's out of his own mercy. Your testimony is not tight related. You are the one that is relating it to tight. You are the one who is relating it to tight. God may honor your giving, but it has nothing to do with tithing. And you see, people say, well, a lot of people are doing this. You know, one of the things that troubled my heart when God began to speak to me and show me this from his word, I said, Lord, I now mention the name. I said, this man of God is preaching this. This one is preaching this. And look at the numbers of people that believe this. That was when God led me to Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. He says, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Just because there are a lot of people doing it doesn't make it right. That's Exodus 23, verse 2. Exodus 23, 2. Today we have made tight to, um, to become our message. Seed sowing, all those nonsense. We have made it to become our messages. It's very wrong, brethren. It's not possible to tight. You can still claim that you are tightening. You see? see, you are free. You are free. My responsibility is to show you the word of God. It's your responsibility to cross-check it and see whether it's something you want to follow or you want to follow something else. It's, it's your responsibility. But God has made the truth available to you. We have been reading all along from scriptures that you also can verify. Like I said, it will pay me to preach tight personally. It will pay me. What do I want to destroy by not preaching tight? What do I stand to gain? What does anybody stand to gain? Like I said, it is because you make Christ of non-effect. That is the crucial matter. 
People don't know. When you think you are fulfilling this law, the fact, the good thing is that it's not possible for you to tithe. It's not possible for you to tithe. It's just like circumcision. We still do circumcision, but we are not doing circumcision in line with the word of God. It's just our own medical traditional practice. It has nothing to do with the law. We are not sacrificing. We are not circumcising because the law says we should circumcise. You must understand that the flesh, which God was trying to explain to Abraham through circumcision, today that flesh has been nailed to the cross. Romans chapter 6. Our flesh has been circumcised through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, somebody may be saying, How does God provide for his servants? You see, Ask yourself, how did God provide it for his servant? How did he provide for Peter and the apostles? How did he provide for Paul, for Barnabas, for Silas, for Timothy, for many of them, Silvanus? How did God provide for them? For Philip, how did he provide for him? Yet, they were not titan. They were not preaching titan. So, see... It's you that you are thinking that you need tithe for God to provide for his genuine servant. God has been providing for me also. Now, if you read Isaiah 43 verse 1, it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom I so delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to Gentiles. It says, my servant whom I uphold. It is God that uphold the servant. It is not tight. When God calls you, he will provide for you. And I'm still going to go into more detail as I go on. That's why I said, please be patient. By the grace of God, I believe God will address all the questions on your heart. So God does provide for his servant. How does he provide for them? One, by faith. Everyone who must work with God must work with him by faith. You must trust God for your provision. Even those of us who are still any salary, it is God. In fact, I wouldn't even have been in this job because I didn't even apply to be in this job when I got it. It is the mercy of God. God will provide. And I've seen that this salary, the salary can't even take care of me. So I have to depend on God. Up to today, I still tell God I need a shoe. I need um, this. I need it. I've had some people say, oh, I don't, they don't ask anything. They don't ask all those things like that. It's good. If you feel you have grown where you don't need to ask, it's good. For me, that anything I still go to God to ask, Lord, I need a laptop. Lord, I need a phone. Lord, I need a car. Lord, I need, it. one day I went to preach. And the, the places, the place I went, ah. <sighs> It would destroy my car if I have to be visiting those places regularly. And so why come in and I say, Lord, I need a four-wheel drive. I need something strong. I don't have it yet. And I'm happy I don't have it yet. Because somebody will say, ah, because he has it, that's why he's talking. I don't have it yet. But it's not a problem for me. I know that if God will be sending me to those places again, then he will do something about getting me there. So God provides for his servant by faith. Every servant of God must first of all learn to trust God for their provision. If what you are looking at is the church, is some sponsor here and there. In fact, God is a jealous God. He doesn't want that. God may give sponsors. God may raise the church. The church has responsibility. I will get to that also. But you must put your trust absolutely in the Lord. Then secondly, God provides for a servant through work. If you can work, work. Paul worked. He made tents. In some churches, he didn't work. They supply his needs. Let's balance it. He was telling the Corinthian church, when I was with you, I worked. So that you will not say tomorrow, and thank God he worked. Because what the church now became later, they will, they will be like, and so what we were paying you, we were paying you. So what was the problem? He said, none of you can glory because I worked and I was not a burden to you in any way. If you are able to walk, walk, earn a living. 
along with what you are doing, depending on the nature of your ministry. Some you may not be able to do anything else. Okay? Now, the Bible says that by the altar, it provides by the altar. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 to 14. Let me read what it says. It says, Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so had the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Jesus has ordained it. So there is nothing wrong living from the gospel. So now how does this operate? See, people will, uh, God will touch people's heart to send things to you. There are times when I'm completely broke. And I will just see money on my phone. And somebody will say, I just thought I should bless you. And at times I just cry. And I'm like, God, how did, how did you know How did you know about this? And my life has been a constant miracle of provision. You see, for me, God's provision is not a one-time experience that I will tell you that, you know, in 1970, uh, okay, I was born 79 anyway, so I can't tell 70 story. In 1989, God did. No, for me... I can tell you God's provision, even today, even today, from unexpected source. I was just discussing with somebody that you couldn't believe that at, at so, so, so time, I had nothing, you know, and so on. And the person was like, wow, he can't believe that I've been through that, that he knows me that I don't mention things like that. And then the person put some money on my table. Today, the day I'm recording this message. My clothing, my, my life is a testimony of the provision of God. And whatever I don't have, I believe it is not yet time uh, for me to have it. Now, so you will notice that God had ordained it. Now, let me read uh, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14 to 17 to you. It says, even so the Lord had ordained that everyone which preach should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things. I'm reading it further. Paul didn't abuse it. You must, we must maintain balance, brethren. He didn't abuse it with the Corinthians, even though it was within his liberty to allow them to provide for him. He didn't abuse it. You see, there are places you will go. You must not even take something. I went one day to a church to go and preach. When we gave offering, I perceived that when they, when they brought envelope to me when I was going, I perceived it was the money I gave that they had put in that envelope to bring to me. I didn't accept, I couldn't accept that envelope. You know, there are places you go, there are places I tell them ahead of time, please don't prepare anything for me. And there are places I go, I gladly accept whatever they present to me. So Paul didn't abuse it. He was still working in the spirit to check can I take this? Can I not take this? Brethren, be careful. It's not everybody that can give to the work of God. The end does not justify the means for us. The means justifies the end. How you achieve it is important to God than what was achieved. Please uh, keep that in mind. Psalm 121 verse 1 to 8. I'll just read some of it. It says, I will lift up my eye unto the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made the heaven and the earth. Where must your eye be? On the hills. Servant of God, put your eye on the hills. So there's nothing wrong. You can place your pastor on salary. God can put it in your heart. A minister, particularly those who are just itinerary ministers, we must put them in heart in the body of Christ. Some are drama minister that they may not have the time to have regular job. And they don't have a church that can fund them regularly. We must understand we are one body and we must constantly minister to these people. There are those who are operating a missions-based ministry. So they don't have a church, but they can't have time for regular employment. The church must support all of this. So God may put it in your heart and say, look at this ministry. Um, put resources into it. Take it further. You know, so God provides for his servant in different ways. Now, 
everything we have said, the same thing applies to offerings and first fruit. Because I will not, it will not be good to just talk about tithes and not talk about offerings. Now, when Bible talks about offering, it is not talking about the contribution we do in church today. When we assemble together and then you drop something in the box, that's not what he's talking about. It's talking about a bond offering, heave offering, wave offerings, all of those things. So let's not confuse uh, the language, but the principle is the same. We are not giving those kind of offerings, but can we give in the body of Christ or when we gather together, can we make contribution? Yes. Now, the, what should guide our giving should be love. It should not be investment. You know, they preach tight like an investment. What should guide our giving? One is love. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 45. And all that believe were together and had all things in common, and sold their possession and goods, and parted them to all men as every man need. That's, that's love. No greater love can a man have than for a man to lay down his life for his friend. They lay down their life for one another. The same thing happened in Acts chapter 4. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, He said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So we must give out of love. Now, the principle of setting aside uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 to 2, Paul said, Now, concerning the collection for sin, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. If I read it in other versions, it says, in contemporary English version, it says, When you collect money for God's people, I want you to do exactly what I told the church churches in Galatia to do. That is, each Sunday, each of you should put aside some part of what you have earned. If you do this, you won't have to take up collection when I come. So, praise God. You see, the Bible is absolutely clear. This is not tithe. This is not first fruit. This is not seed. Whatever you earn, lay aside some. So, as if you are, uh, you could be a private person working for yourself. You could be a business person, chasing contract and so on. You can be employed. You know, whatever income is coming to you, you can decide and say that I want to give, um, let's say, eighteen percent. That I'll be giving eighteen percent. Set it aside. Let that go to the church. There's nothing wrong with that. You can say I want to give. Um, 12% or you can say I want to give 2% lay it aside do that regularly there's nothing wrong with that but you are not tightening we should actually give more you know so it is left for you you must give willingly you must give um, out of love so we can take that collections that we do every Sunday uh, we can take all of that we have the principles for giving generally uh, in in some of these scriptures, for example, Second Corinthians verse eight, uh, chapter eight, verse twelve, it says, "For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man had, not according to that he had not." So, if you don't have something, don't pledge. Just give out of what you have. Don't make vow. Jesus said we should not make vow. In Second Corinthians six seven, uh, Second Corinthians nine six to seven, it says. But this I say, he which sweats sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He which sweats bountifully shall also reap bountifully. So don't say, well, because we are not paying tithe, people will reduce what they are giving. No. You don't know what it means when people give out of conviction by the Holy Spirit. Stop scaring people. Let the Holy Spirit work upon people's hearts. You will see how people will give. I'm telling you, the body of Christ, people will, people will surprise you with giving. Uh, Exodus 25 verse 2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take offering. Stop all these cajoling people. Each time they want to take offering in some churches, somebody will have to come up and cajole them, cajole them, cajole them, and say, Speak to your offering. 
Please never speak to your offering. Speak to Jesus. Don't speak to any offering. Don't say this. Just give this offering. It belongs to him. Just give it. He will reward you. Exodus 35, 21 says, And they came, everyone whose heart steered him up, and everyone whom his spirit is whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the lost offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garment. Everybody that the spirit had touched. That's the offering that is acceptable to God. That's what God wants. In 1 Chronicles 29 verse 9 says, Then the people rejoiced, for they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. Perfect heart. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. You must offer willingly, and you must offer with great joy. So the same thing applies to first fruits. Jesus Christ uh, has become our first fruit. In fact, if you read the law of first fruit again, you will see a lot of things. So there's nobody that is paying first fruit. Somebody will say, well, it's in proverb that you should bring your first fruit to the Lord. Yes, it's in, it's in proverb that you should bring your first fruit to the Lord. Now, if I read a passage, Second Chronicles 31 verse 5, it says, and as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruit of corn. Notice, of corn, wine, and oil, honey, and all of the increase of the field. And the tithe of all things brought they in ab abundantly. So, tithe, first fruit, they are all part of the law. But the real first fruit is Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 23 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become and become the first fruit of them that slept. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward, they which are Christ at his coming. So our Lord Jesus Christ is our first fruit. Now, if you decide and say you want to give your first salary. To a, to a kingdom cause. You are very much free, please. You are very much free. But don't let anybody tell you that God is requiring first fruit from you. The same, uh, the same law applies. In fact, if you read Proverbs, it says, Proverbs verse, chapter 3, verse 9, says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thy increase. Now, what that scripture is saying is, Honor the Lord. Now, how can they honor the Lord? It is by obeying him. Now, if they were to bring their increase to God, it means when they bring it, they honor the Lord. So that's why you have it in Proverbs. But the operating phrase there is honor the Lord. That's how, that's what God really wants. Honor the Lord. How do you honor the Lord today? By offering your life completely. When God owns your life, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, when you surrender yourself completely to him, he owns everything that belongs to you. So all these first fruit issues, they are just uh, uh, a game to, to take people's money, to do people of their resources. There is no requirement like that in the word of God. Paul didn't preach it. Peter didn't preach it. Uh, in the book of Revelation, there was no... No writings, no nothing like that by our Lord Jesus Christ to the church. Now, what are the dangers of paying tithe or thinking you are paying tithe? You know, we have said that it's impossible to tithe, but the real burden for which I have come out to share this video is really what I'm about to share now. The danger of paying tithe. We can't see this and keep quiet. And some people say, what's your business about this issue of tithe, tithe? Just leave people and go and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? You know, people don't understand that the gospel is not just salvation message. The salvation message is the entering point into the gospel. The gospel is the message of Christ and his kingdom. In other words, the entire teachings of Christ. Jesus told his disciples, he said, go and teach all nations everything whatsoever I've commanded you. That's the gospel. So the gospel is not just telling people, come and accept Jesus Christ. That's the way some people conceive the gospel in their heart. They think just telling people to come and accept Jesus, that's when you are preaching the gospel. No. 
is the message of the kingdom. What I'm teaching now is the message of the kingdom. I am teaching biblical giving in the context of the kingdom of God. For we have been translated from the uh, power of Satan, of darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son. So our life is governed by the teachings, the principles, and more importantly, the life of the kingdom of Christ. So what are the dangers of paying tight? James chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. Look at what it says. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point he is guilty of all. We have established the tightings of the law. It is not correct for somebody to say tithing was before the law because Abraham paid the law. Abraham paid tight. We've established that clearly. We saw what Abraham did. And he never, it was not something he was doing weekly, monthly, or yearly. And he didn't pay for his, from his own income. So it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So if you want to keep tithing, please keep every aspect of the law. Everything that the law says, you better be keeping it. Otherwise, uh, you are violating the law. Then Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 to 3. Galatians chapter 5 verse 2 to 4. Galatians 3, 1 to 3. Galatians 5, 2 to 4. Let me read them. It says, O foolish Galatians, who had bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Holy Spirit by the works of the law? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by paying tithes? Or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. You have fallen from grace. This is the burden that has made me under God to share this message with his, belief, with his children. The church will not suffer anything. You can't keep the law anymore. Christ will only become of no effect over your life if you are trying to keep the law. You cannot even tithe. It is impossible for anybody to tithe. Yet God has made provision for giving and for providing for his work, for his servant, for his children, for his body. The love of Jesus Christ must govern everything that we do. I have shared this with us by the grace of God with a sincere heart. Stop feeling guilty. You know, they have so much preached this tithing thing that if, if somebody says, okay, I'm not going to tithe, and then challenges suddenly come, the person will be like, okay, maybe it's because I'm no longer tight, tightening. That's how they have made this thing to become. What we are supposed to do in our assembly is to preach Jesus, not principles of finance. We are to set forth Jesus. We just read now, Paul said, Christ has been set forth before you, crucified before you. Jesus is the message. Jesus has accomplished everything for us on the cross of Calvary. You can't pay for what he has done. Please repent. God will have mercy on you. You may have been doing it in ignorance. You may have never taken your time to study his word like this. God is merciful. He will, he will give you, uh, he will receive you. And he will forgive you. And you see, in the end, the body of Christ will not suffer. The work of God will not suffer. There are places where they have come to this understanding. I don't mind 
uh if you i'm invited and say please can you come and explain this further i will we will open the scripture together if you have other scriptures you say okay what about this scripture that is how we we should operate in the body of christ but i believe that i'm convinced in my heart that the holy spirit has set forth his word before you today now you know the truth run with it and let this principle applies to every other thing you believe in the scripture search and be sure read the bible research whatever you are being taught like the berean church to check whether it's true everything i've said check whether it is true and the lord himself will give you understanding our prayer is that only jesus will be glorified i will put the link to the book that i mentioned earlier the book is titled back to the bible on tithe offerings and false food and it's available on amazon you may you may want to get it but basically i've shared everything uh, most of the things in the book in this video there was also an audio i made some 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 time back to also offer further explanation the link will also be included in the description below please share this message to help god's children to free them from guilt to free them from legalistic actions to free them from the greed of some of their men of god there are men of god that have been doing this in ignorance when they come in contact with the truth they repent and for those men to god be the glory there are those that are just out to defraud you they are just out to steal your money if you are such please repent today and god himself will have mercy on you you may consider subscribing to this station uh to this channel rather my name once again is olushegun mokolu may the peace and grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all. let every man be liar let god be true let the name of jesus be hallowed and honored forever Amen. God bless you.